me begin just by uh, pointing out that uh, if you follow the news coverage and journal articles on basic income, uh, most of the interest uh, recently has been sparked by uh, the new waves of automation, particularly coming from artificial intelligence. Uh, one Oxford study has projected as many as 47% of current jobs in the United States could be eliminated in the next couple of decades. Uh, and another source of interest in basic income has been the increasing shares of wealth and income flowing to property owners rather than to workers. Uh, Thomas Piketty's book has been one source of um, interest in that. Um, and people see universal basic income as one instrument for redistributing income and or wealth, facilitating job sharing, and promoting forms of social engagement beyond wage labor. What I have in mind there is um, things like um, uh, home care, child care, elder care, volunteering, all of which are important social contributions but are often unrecognized and unremunerated and occur in conditions of um, subordination. Uh, but what I want to emphasize today is not these things, but something that I think is equally important, and if some of you could get the next uh, slide, uh, the environmental limits to growth, uh, especially limits needed to avoid catastrophic climate change. Uh, carbon taxes or caps, when the revenue is used <coughs> for per capita dividends, can be one basis for a partial basic income. Uh, or it could be one among several different sources for a full basic income, by which I mean an income adequate for basic needs. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about green growth, uh, and by means of such pollution taxes, it might be possible to decouple economic growth from carbon emissions. Uh, but I'm going to be raising some questions about that in this talk, uh, asking whether our ecological targets to stay below 2 degrees centigrade temperature rise are compatible with economic growth, uh, or if on the contrary, it may be necessary to aim for degrowth. And the next slide. Uh, it's a kind of a grim talk, so I thought I'd start with a joke. Uh, more than any other time in history, mankind faces a crossroads. One path leads to despair and utter hopelessness, the other to total extinction. Let us pray we have the wisdom to choose. <laughs> philosopher put it. Uh, but what's not a joke is what uh, Tim Jackson has called the dilemma of growth. If we continue on the course of economic growth, we're reporting ecological disaster. But on the other hand, if we aim for slow, zero, or even negative growth, we will spark high unemployment and rising inequality. Uh, so what I want to address is first, can green growth avoid the dilemma? growth. Uh, I'll then present the ecological case for degrowth. Uh, I'll talk about the economic implications of degrowth and then say a little bit at the end about uh, where basic income might fit in in a degrowth society. It does have a fairly clear place in a green growth strategy uh, and I'll say more about that in a moment. So, uh, by green growth we mean oops, the claim that it is possible to decouple economic growth and carbon emissions. The next slide. And there's some evidence that this may be happening. Um, the, uh, if you look at the last, just the last couple of years, while worldwide growth has continued to increase, carbon emissions seem to have leveled off. Uh, have the next slide. Uh, so what could be done to reconcile possibly slower economic growth, but still growth, and economic sustainability? Steve Pressman and Robert Scott have uh, proposed a more progressive tax structure, inheritance taxes, uh, higher income taxes on the wealthy, wealth taxes, corporate taxes, without which there will be greater tax pressure on less wealthy citizens to pay for the social state, yet those incomes may be insufficient. Uh, and they also propose, because the paper is concerned with reconciling uh, economic sustainability with uh, progressive social policies to use some of the tax revenue to support programs that boast renewable energy technology and reduce environmental pollution. 
reducing inequality while improving energy efficiency. So we're still increasing growth, but it's green growth. The next slide. Um, a centerpiece of any such green growth strategy would be a carbon tax or alternatively a carbon cap. Uh, and the point of this would be to redirect and perhaps also slow economic growth. Uh, some part, partisans of this see it as actually increasing growth. Uh, but in any case, you want to give incentives for more efficient use of carbon intensive uh, energy by increasing the cost of carbon fuels and making the carbon free energy uh, more competitive. Uh, and you could use the revenue, as Pressman and Scott put it, for spending programs that reduce the need for people to work in order to maintain their standard of living. Now, there are many different ways you might do that, but a basic income is a sort of obvious candidate there. If you give people unconditional income, unrelated to work, then it reduces the need for them to work in order to make ends meet. Uh, skip this slide and go on. I'm going to directly address concerns with the carbon tax. Uh, I can go back. Go, go back to the last slide. We got time. Uh, this is Pressman and Scott. I like that you're in the work. Okay. Um, a part of their broader program uh, with respect to job loss is to promote worker cooperatives uh, and or profit sharing or some form of market socialism. Those are all in a sort of field of you know, broadening worker ownership and control. Uh, you could have a guaranteed job program, particularly green jobs that are necessary to make the transition from fossil fuels to uh, renewables. And these could be funded from the increased taxes I mentioned before. Um, and they mentioned sharing the work. And again, basic income could be an important part of a strategy to share the work because if people have an income stream that is unrelated to work, it makes it easier for them to have a decent life uh, in a job that is not the same number of hours that they would have worked uh, without it. So, next slide. Um, so, back to the carbon tax. Uh, Pressman and Scott raise three concerns, and I think all of them have reasonable answers. The first is regressivity. Uh, any, any form of energy tax uh, is going to um, fall heavily on poor and working class families because they spend a higher proportion of their household budgets on energy, on heating their homes, uh, driving their cars to work, and so on. Uh, however, uh, if you recycle the revenues through cuts in payroll taxes or through social programs that benefit poor and working class families, or alternatively, if you give everybody a carbon dividend, uh, there will be a net gain financially from carbon tax in the lower half of the uh, income population. Um, second concern is how you monitor emissions. If, you have, if, you're, if you're taxing carbon emissions, how do you monitor the emissions? Uh, and the answer there is simply to impose the tax on the carbon fuel at the front end of the cycle. You tax uh, the coal and the oil and the natural gas at the mines and the wellheads and the ports and entry. And then the cost of that gets passed through the economy in higher energy prices. Um, so you don't have to worry about the emissions. You've already taxed them before they have occurred. Um, third concern is that, as we know, climate change is a global problem. So it has to be tackled globally. And there, there is a need for a global policy. Uh, what do you do if you don't have that? And one of the biggest polluters in the United States has declared it's pulling out of the Paris Agreement. So uh, what do you do? Well, uh, countries can do th something to nudge this along. Uh, if it were the United States that were trying to nudge it along, we could impose tariffs at the border on the carbon content of imports so that countries that were, uh, were uh, not imposing their own carbon tax would then have a choice. They could pay the tax on the import into the United States and the money would go to Americans, or they could impose a carbon tax on their own citizens and keep the revenue for themselves. So uh, tariffs at the border is a way of uh, at least countries with some market power in the world economy can impose, uh, you know, put pressure on creating the tax globally in that way. So I have the next slide. Um, so I want to now raise some questions about green growth. 
first by looking at what is needed to stay below 2 degrees centigrade. I think we just have to take a serious look at the numbers uh, to speculate about what kind of carbon tax this might require. Uh, I was toying with the idea that could you actually achieve that target just with a carbon tax? I, I, I could become skeptical of that, but I, so you'll see uh, why in a moment. Uh, and then to ask, is this possible with green growth or does it, does it uh, signal degrowth? And then finally, again, to, to address what uh, meaning basic income might have in relation to either green growth or degrowth. Okay, the next slide. Um, so uh, the first concept we need to address is the carbon budget. Uh, I think probably most of you know that uh, when you put carbon dioxide, so dioxide into the atmosphere, it stays in the atmosphere for centuries. So the important thing is not our annual emissions so much as the accumulation of those over time. And the longer we go without addressing uh, climate change, the smaller budget we have to work with before we exceed the environmental uh, sort of uh, catastrophe levels. Um, and so this bar here is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change estimates that we have from 2014, so it's, we're already a little past that, from 2014 we can put into the atmosphere about 1,000 uh, gigatons of carbon dioxide before we go over 2 degrees centigrade. We have a 66% chance of staying below 2C if we do that. Uh, the the eco-equity group uh, has a, a, what they call a strong 2C pathway that is a better than 66% chance. That would give us a budget of 785. And I just took the average of those. If you give me the next slide. Uh, to stay below 2 degrees centigrade, this would work out to be about 3 tons of carbon dioxide per person per year globally. Uh, and the way I calculated that was, again, to average those two carbon budgets Divide by the world population, I used 8 million because it's sort of in between where we are now and where we're expected to be by mid-century. And then I figured 80% of that to allow for the remaining 20% in the last half of the 21st century. Uh, and then divide by 30 for the next 30 years to get the uh, annual per capita budget. So if I could have the next slide, uh, this is kind of a reality check. This is where we're at. The, the global average uh, carbon emissions are five times, not three. Uh, and the United States is, uh, the average American is emitting about five times their budget. Uh, China, the EU, about twice their carbon budget. Uh, India, Sub-Saharan Africa, other poor countries, uh, much below that, and there's a little bit of a possibility of hope that we can work something out because of that. And I'll come back to that in a moment. So we have the next slide. Uh, I want to address the question, what is a fair share of emissions reductions? That three, three uh, tons of CO2 per year is what you might call an equal per capita shares approach. And Peter Singer has recommended that in <coughs> the world. Uh, and there are at least two problems with that, that it's not it's not egalitarian enough. Uh, first of all, because it completely ignores historical responsibility. It just takes what we have left and it divides that responsibility over the whole globe. It ignores what's put in, been put into the atmosphere by England and the United States and other countries since the Industrial Revolution. It ignores what people who are still alive have been doing since 1950. Uh, and uh, it ignores what's been put into the atmosphere since 1990, which is about the time when you could say every country in the world reasonably could uh, appreciate that this is a, a, a shared responsibility. Uh, the second problem is that it ignores uh, ability to pay. Um, people in the United States can better shoulder this burden than people in sub-Saharan Africa or India or China. Uh, and so that ought to be factored into our assessment of what is a fair share. So really, Americans should be, um, uh, uh, should have less than three tons per person in a way, and 
other people should be allowed more. That's one way to think of it. There's a different way to configure it, but I'll come to that in a moment. Uh, Simon Caney, Equal Equity Group, then come up with a proposal to, to calculate fair shares. You should take into account, in addition to what the per capita level is, uh, polluter pays. So you take into account past emissions, at least to 1990, maybe earlier, uh, inability to pay. Uh, and one way to think of that is that there's a threshold, uh, eco-equity says $7,500 per person per year, below which you're not responsible for contributing to the solution to climate change. That's your, your, that's your uh, uh, sort of a substantial poverty threshold, below which people are not responsible for paying for the cost of a transition to the fossil, fossil free future. And this, interestingly, kind of, it's, it's an interpretation of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, uh, which says that we should aim for greenhouse gas stabilization on the basis of equity in accordance with their common but differentiated responsibilities and respective capacities. Responsibilities has to do with past pollution and capacities with ability to absorb this without uh, human rights uh, losses. So, um, this is from equal equity again, and taking into account that more robust notion of fair shares, um, this is what the United States would be responsible for doing in terms of carbon emission reductions. And the middle equity set setting is a kind of modest uh, principle that includes both uh, pollution since 1950 and um, uh, ability to pay. Uh, I'm going to actually focus on uh, a not quite so progressive one because it's pretty challenging as it is. Uh, this ignores ability to pay. It just looks at pollution since 1990. So it's a little more egalitarian than the equal per capita shares. But on this measure, the United States would need to reduce its carbon emissions uh, by 90% below 1990 levels by 2025. 90%. Uh, now, that's not going to happen. Uh, but there is something that could happen that would still meet the principle of that. And this is equal you, say, you say it's not, it's not going to happen, but that's still the easiest one, you said, didn't you? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, what, what's required on the, where you factor in some ability to pay, is we would have to reduce our carbon emissions to more than 100% below 1990 levels. That's a physical impossibility. What that says is if you start really start taking equity seriously, we've already blown our budget. On one measure, we used up all our permissible carbon. If you go back to 1850, we used up all of our permissible carbon around 1945. Okay? We're burning other people's carbon now. Okay? Um, but, uh, so take this you know, less demanding approach. How do you, how do you uh, deliver on that? Is that possible? Well, uh, what the people at Equal Equity have suggested is uh, because there are some people who are using less than their quota, it is possible for us to pay them to stay below their quota. In other words, to enable them to get out of poverty without burning carbon fuels. We will pay for their solar panels. We will do the research and development and give it away. We will do the technology transfer. We will dispense with intellectual property rights and things like that. That's costly, but we could reduce our emissions by 46% by 2025. That's more ambitious than most anybody's talking about, but I think that's at least conceivable. And the other 44% of our responsibility, we pay other people to do. That's the idea. I think that's at least, uh, I mean, how you get the politics to make this happen, that's uh, anybody's guess. But it's at least, this is some kind of a, a feasible strategy. So I got the next slide, and this is just a magnifying one, so go one beyond that. This is just another way to visualize that. This yellow dot is the U.S. Paris Pledge. It's about 23% below 1990 levels by 2025. So it's what we pledged, and you know, Trump has said we're not going to do it, but if we did it, uh, we would be halfway where we need to be to the 46%. So if we could just double down on what was 
promised it at Paris. And, and the Paris Agreement was, here's where we're starting, we're going to try to do more. We're even going to try to stay below one and a half degrees centigrade. I'm not, but you're really going to have to go further than this to do that. Uh, but, and then we, depending on which equity measure you use, the weakest one would say, about as that much again we have to take responsibility for it elsewhere uh, in poorer countries. And, you know, it gets larger if you build in a higher degree of equity. So, next slide, please. Um, so I tried to calculate what kind of carbon tax might enable the United States to get its emissions 46% below 1990 levels by 2025. Uh, the Carbon Tax Center has an online calculator. It's, it's constructed using projections from uh, empirical evidence of su supply and demand in energy markets. And what happens if you put a tax on how does that depress demand and so on. Uh, and so I just kept raising the tax level until I got the emission level down to 46% uh, below 1990 in 2025. And to do that, you start at $35 per ton, and you increase it by $35 every year. Um, now, I have to add that this is quite speculative. I, I ran the idea past the guy who designed the calculator, and he said, who knows? Nobody has any experience with carbon taxes ramped up this round. Uh, but if, if you did this, and you, you distributed it all as a dividend, this is the basic, partial basic income dimension of this, it would give everybody a dividend of, of about $2,600 a year, which is higher than the last permanent fund dividend. So it's a significant partial basic income or, or resource dividend. Uh, and combined with other sources could be a way of funding the basic income. Uh, now, the big caveat here is that uh, this assumes that producers and consumers could adapt their behavior with this rapid change in carbon tax. And, and my worry is that it, doesn't, it won't do that. It will simply depress demand. People will be unable to pay their transportation costs. They'll be unable to pay their heating oil. And it would just induce a recession. Okay. So that gets us more into the degrowth territory. So again, the next slide. Uh, most carbon taxes want to reduce emissions below 2 degrees centigrade and at the same time to incentivize alternative investments in a smooth transition to a fossil free economy. We would started this 30 years ago. It might have been uh, not so difficult to do. That's green growth. Okay? Uh, but as I say, my worry is that the kind of, at least if you just, your instrument is the carbon tax, you're just going to depress the economy. Uh, you can see in the history of carbon, when we've had, when we've had actually a, a, a fall in carbon emissions, it's when there's a recession or the collapse of the Soviet economy, you know, big economic shocks like that. We could bring our emissions down in that way, but I, I, that's pretty hazardous politically for anybody to actually deliberately do that. Uh, so, next slide. Uh, we have to think about not only relative decoupling of emissions from uh, economic activity, but also absolute decoupling, a decline in total carbon emissions. And this is a couple of quotations from Tim Jackson, who has written about this. Uh, and he wrote his book, uh, Prosperity Without Growth, was written about a decade ago. And he said, Global carbon intensity declined from just over one kilogram uh, CO2 per dollar in 1980 to 770 in 2006, but emissions today are 40% higher than they were in 1990. And since the year 2000, they've been growing at over 3% per year. Now, they seem to have leveled off in, in, since he's written his book, but uh, they've not started going down appreciably. If we have the next slide. Uh, so, uh, I'm not really a numbers person, but I do think we have to think about the numbers to really appreciate the gravity of the problem. Uh, this is a fairly simple, it's called the Ehrlich formula applied to carbon emissions. Uh, the 
uh, CO2 emissions total is a function of the population times the um, income per person, GDP per person, uh, multiplied by the grams of CO2 per dollar of GDP. Uh, that gives you the total carbon emissions. Uh, now, carbon intensity has declined by 7 tenths percent annually since 1990. We are becoming more efficient in our use of carbon fuels and replacing them with other fuels. But the population and the incomes have grown. Um, population has grown by 1.3 percent annually. Uh, and incomes have grown by 1.4 percent annually. So we end up with 2 percent annual growth in carbon emissions, at least up until the last couple of years. Um, so, uh, what would we have to do to bring the emissions down if population continues to grow at 7 tenths percent, as demographers project, uh, and if we don't uh, improve our carbon intensity, reduce that more than 7 tenths of a percent annually, income growth would have to stop. You'd have to have zero growth. Uh, and if income growth continues at 1.4 percent a year, never mind the 3 percent Tony Trump wants, uh, then by 2050 CO2 emissions would be 80 percent higher than in 2009. Okay, so the next slide. Uh, so what about this evidence that there's some absolute decoupling happening? Again, the next slide after this. Uh, World Resources Institute, just to add a little bit to that graph, uh, the United States has become 28% richer, but 6% cleaner since 2000. And um, World Resources Institute reports that since 2021 countries in Europe, the United States, and Uzbekistan have reduced their carbon emissions while growing GDP. Uh, and England, is, for example, has grown its economy 27% by cutting emissions by 20%. And the next slide. Uh, but, uh, uh, there are some questions about this. First is offshoring. And what I mean by this is countries appear to be reducing their emissions, but uh, they have offshored the production. And then the imports are coming back in. So if I could have the next slide. Uh, in Sweden, uh, Swedes are among the best in, in this. Uh, they have a 72% reduction in carbon intensity since 1990. But, uh, if you factor in the uh, consumption in international trade that's connected with the offshoring of their production, the emissions were at least 25% higher than previously assumed. Uh, so is this just a zero sum? Uh, maybe not. World Resources Institute argues that these 21 nations show an average emissions reduction of 15%, but cuts in the industrial share of GDP are just so maybe the emissions reduction is greater, even taking into account the offshore. But that's not the only problem. <clears throat> okay, the next slide. The World Resources Institute does not take into account deforestation, which is an important contributor to climate change. It does not take into account plans around the world for expansion of aviation, which is expected to triple its emissions. Um, it doesn't take into account methane leakage. A lot of the U.S. reduction in carbon emissions is because we shifted from coal to natural gas, but if you don't take into account the methane leakage, that may not be such a, a gain. And finally, there's the, I'm not quite sure how to factor this in, but the rebound effect. If we, if we reduce the cost of our carbon energy by making it more efficient, then do we just use more? And that's a, a, a widespread tendency. So how do we counter that? So next slide. Uh, Kevin Anderson, a leading climate scientist, sums it up saying, set against the small and rapidly dwindling carbon emissions budgets associated with the Paris Agreement, the tentative signs of decoupling are of little relevance. Next slide. So, uh, this is going back now to Tim Jackson's estimates. Uh, he's talking about 4.9% annual emissions reductions in order to achieve the ecological target. <clears throat> he was writing this almost a decade ago, so that number would have to be higher, more like 6%. But never, just to go with his figures, 
This would require not a 0.7% reduction in carbon intensity, but a 7% reduction in carbon intensity, 10 times the level of reduction of emissions than we are now, not the reduction in uh, carbon intensity that we are now doing. And this doesn't even take into account uh, efforts that we would want to make to bring the poor of the earth closer to you know, European level of civilization and comfort and so on. And it doesn't take into account factoring in something like a 2% growth for the developed countries. Uh, the multi multiplier would have to be more than 10%, 9 or 11. Uh, but setting that aside, uh, if I could have the next slide, um, could we do that? Could we achieve 7% uh, uh, reduction in carbon intensity uh, in a couple of decades? Um, I'm, I'm going to just briefly refer to two studies, um, both from the, in the proceedings of the National Academy of Science. The first, which is widely quoted, is uh, Mark Jacobson and others. Um, and uh, the second is uh, some critics of that. So I have the next slide. Uh, Jacobson and others have argued that it is technically and economically feasible across all sectors of the economy of the contiguous United States to achieve a 100% reliance on wind, water, and solar energy by 2050-2055. And I just sat down and calculated in a kind of uh, crude way on literally on the back of an envelope, uh, that's more than 70% annual reductions. So that, uh, if, if, if they're right, it's, it's uh, technically feasible. Uh, unfor unfortunately, there's no consensus in support of analysis. The other paper, I can have the next slide, they argue that Jacobson et al. do not show the technical, practical, economic feasibility of 100% solar, wind, solar, and hydroelectric energy vision. They do think that you could achieve an 80% decarbonization of the electric grid at a reasonable cost, not by means of wind, water, and solar alone, but with nuclear, biofuel, carbon capture, and storage technology would also be required. And as if you follow this, the carbon capture and storage is very controversial. It's not, no, nobody's shown that it's economically viable or that it even works enough to keep the emissions down. So, and uh, their estimate of the 80% is the electric grid. It doesn't include transportation. So, uh, so next slide. Uh, let's see. Yeah, uh, just to approach this from another angle. The Stern Review, which was a major British study, uh, argued for a 500 parts per million CO2 target, which would likely go significantly over 2 degrees centigrade, that that would involve a cost to GDP of 2%. And as Tim Jackson points out, though these numbers look rather small, they're already about the same order of magnitude as the difference between a growing economy and a non-growing economy. Um, and as Dieter Helm, another climate scientist, puts it, the easy compatibility between economic growth and climate change, which lies at the heart of the Stern Report is an illusion. So I have the next slide. Um, so my verdict on green growth, I'm still trying to sort through all this. But I would say it's not impossible, but it's very unlikely that a green growth path will stay below 2 degrees centigrade. And just as an aside, if you're thinking about the Paris Accords, uh, numerous analyses of the projections of the promises Never mind if they're kept or not. Just the promises that people made. We're headed toward three degrees centigrade. Okay. Uh, so advocates of green growth, I would suggest, should acknowledge this and call for adaptation as well as mitigation. Now, the problem with that is um, if we try to adapt to two degrees or more temperature rise, what is the cost economically, politically, culturally, and ecologically? Uh, this is from the uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Even at one degree, we're starting to get into the high level of risk for unique and threatened systems. 
and two degrees we're in the high risk for several of them and when you get up to four we're already in the very high risk and just to remind you of what those categories are if you could give me the next slide unique and threatened systems refers to things like coral reefs uh, next slide um, extreme weather events hurricanes extreme precipitation droughts wildfires ty typhoon Typhoon Haiyan, the most destructive storm ever recorded in the Pacific. Uh, over, I think, was it three or five thousand people killed. Typhoon Haiyan, drought, uh, Lake Mead. This was a uh, several uh, the driest California experienced in several hundred years. Uh, distribution of impacts refers to the fact that risks are greater for disadvantaged people and communities. Some examples, Hurricane Katrina. Uh, sea level rise will particularly affect people living in floodplains of rivers, Bangladesh. Uh, several million people potentially affected from storm surges and sea level rise there. Puerto Rico, obviously in recent news. Uh, global aggregate impacts refers to both economic, global economic effects, but also biodiversity. And uh, polar bears. And, typical example of that. And large-scale singular events, uh, like the loss of glaciers and ice sheets, uh, and uh, uh, the, this is Greenland, uh, and uh, the next slide is uh, Antarctic. Uh, between the two of these, we're looking at uh, many meters of sea level rise over a millennium. That it's a millennium is easy to put it off, but and the scientists have not been successful in modeling how fast this is the ice melts will occur and how quickly this will affect sea level rise. But they're melting faster than the models are predicting. Uh, our senator from Maine, Angus King, who is not given to hyperbole, went to, to Greenland and the climate scientists he consulted with there said we should expect a foot of sea level rise in the next 15 years, and a foot every decade thereafter. It's hard to imagine how coastal cities anywhere in the world can adapt to that. So this is one of the scarier implications, and it's, it's hard to wrap your mind around it. And we don't have, because we can't pinpoint exactly when and how fast this will happen, uh, it's easy to just push it aside, but it's one of the more alarming of all of the implications of climate change. So in the next slide, um, just an example. Um, island nations are already facing sea level rise. The next slide. Um, so now I want to take up the other horn of the dilemma. Uh, if you have zero or negative growth or slow growth, what this entails for inequality, unemployment, and other economic problems. Uh, Thomas Piketty. Um, has argued that with, as growth slows, and he thinks for reasons unconnected to climate change, uh, developed to capitalist economies, growth is slowing. Uh, and when that happens, the long run ratio of wealth to income, that's beta, gets very large. Because G, growth, gets uh, smaller. S gets larger, so beta gets larger. So it gets very large and begins to approach infinity and inequality soars. So if we, if we deliberately aim toward, uh, stay back at the previous slide, if we, if we deliberately stay, uh, if we de deliberately try to push growth even slower, we're going to exacerbate the problems of inequality connected with capitalist economy. So the next slide, uh, Oaken's Law just says that a one point increase in cyclical unemployment rate is associated with two percentage points of negative growth in real GDP. So if you re reduce GDP by 2%, then you should expect a 1% increase in unemployment. It's a rule of thumb, and I wouldn't put a lot of weight on it, but just to get a kind of a rough idea, uh, if we reduce uh, growth at the level we would need to, um, to meet the environmental target, we should expect somewhere around 3% increase in unemployment just in the normal workings of a market economy. Next slide. 
Um, other problems connected with slow growth. Um, many of our government funding programs are premised on population growth, increasing numbers of people receiving Social Security, Medicaid, Medicare. How are you going to pay for that? Well, the economy will grow. There will be more money. And if it's not growing, then you have to rethink how you're going to fund that uh, debt. You, you borrow, you say, well, we'll take care of the debt because the economy will grow and that will erase the debt. And if it's not growing or if it's shrinking, then the debt is compounded. Uh, and so we're left with this despairing aphorism of Frederick Jameson that it's easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism. Uh, the next slide after that. Uh, so the basic income implications. We have to, uh, if, if we're going to, if, if it seems, as it seems likely, we need to uh, back away from economic growth in order to uh, address the problem of climate change, then we have to think about how to do that other than just, we're going to just crash the economy and then see what happens. Uh, we need to address the property ownership and distribution of fixed or declining income in a profound way. Uh, if we're going to reduce poverty without growth, and you know, the formula, uh, the sort of uh, mainstream formula for addressing poverty is you grow the economy, and then there's more for everybody, and then there's more for the poor. But if you're not growing anymore, and you, want to, you, do, don't, you can't just leave people in poverty, then you're going to have to redistribute the wealth. Uh, and if you want to maintain the quality of life without growth, or if you're actually shrinking, uh, it's essential to ensure that at a minimum people have income security. Uh, and if we move toward greater equality, uh, interestingly, I think a lot of things that people now think are important will cease to be important. So-called positional goods, the things that I need because you have them. Uh, if you don't have them, then I don't need them, and vice versa. So all the things that built into structures of inequality uh, if we reduce inequality, then the positional goods will no longer be necessities. Uh, we can start sharing work, uh, and uh, basic income will be central to that because, as I've said before, uh, if you're working fewer hours and you're getting paid a certain amount per hour, you can still maintain a certain standard of living if you receive income that's not related to work. Uh, but that will entail a wider sharing of unearned income. That is to say, income that you get not because it's remuneration for employment, for, for labor, but income that you get because of some property that you have an income stream from. So if you can take the wealth that now goes to a privileged class of people who get interest and dividends and rents, and that goes to everybody, then there will be your stream of unearned income and your stream of earned income and you can labor less and still maintain a decent standard of living. So next slide. Um, uh, the uh, question I, I guess I'm putting at the end is, is degrowth sound ecology, but does it make for bad politics? Uh, and I'm going to just present a couple of views, and then we can start talking about it. Uh, so uh, Naomi Klein on one side says, uh, and what I read this quote at a basic income conference in Canada. Everybody applauded. Uh, and I said, thank you. And they said, no, we're applauding for Naomi Klein. Uh, but she said, we need to choose the right early policy battles, game-changing ones that don't merely aim to change laws, but change patterns of thought. That means a fight for a minimal carbon tax. It was not so minimal, by the way, as I tried to show. A minimal carbon tax might do a lot less good than, for instance, forming a grand coalition to demand a guaranteed minimum income. That's not, not only because a minimum income makes it possible for workers to say no to dirty energy jobs, but also because the very process of arguing for a universal social safety net opens up the space for a full-throated debate about values, about what we owe to one another based on our shared humanity and what it is that we collectively value more than economic growth and corporate profits. So that's the kind of a positive spin on the degrowth. On the other hand, Ken Halstead, he's actually a part of a, uh, a kind of uh, center-right conservative Republican 
that has interestingly proposed a carbon tax and dividend. The dividend, the tax is not high enough, the dividend is not high enough, but it, the hope is that people who advocate for something more will just be quiet for a bit, get some Republicans on board, and maybe it will pass in the Congress, and then you can ramp it up. Okay, that's the, that's the hope. But anyway, he says, today's green left movement, which deserves much credit for sounding the climate alarm, also deserves blame for framing it in a manner that alienates much of the public. Take Naomi Klein, one of the movement's celebrity authors whose book, This Changes Everything, Capitalism Versus the Climate, advocates degrowth, reduced consumption, and an overthrow of the global economic order. Based on Kahneman's insights about cognitive bias and loss aversion, this is precisely the wrong message to motivate people. These prescriptions are so profoundly at odds with the worldview of those on the opposite end of the political spectrum that it is little wonder why they are tempted to dismiss climate change altogether. Now, the reference to loss aversion there is the, comes from behavioral economics, and it's the idea that you are more averse to losing something you have than you are uh, motivated to gain something that you don't have, even if it's much more valuable. So with respect to climate change, if you impose a carbon tax, you immediately lose money. Uh, in the higher prices you're paying for energy. Uh, and what you hope to gain is what? That in the future, uh, you'll have a better climate. Maybe. Or maybe not, depending on the tipping points. And, or that your other people will, you know, your descendants will have a better life. Uh, but it's, it's so far off that it loses salience. And, and so the idea of a carbon tax with a dividend is that it gives people an immediate economic gain from a policy that's oriented toward reducing the future bad. And he thinks we ought to put the emphasis on that. The Climate Leadership Council is very cautious. Their proposal is designed to mimic the effects of the Clean Power Plan, which Scott Pruitt has just yesterday announced he's doing away with. If you get Republicans on board with this modest carbon fee and dividend, you might at least not lose ground. Uh, and as I say, once you have this in place, it's just a battle over how much you raise it. And if there's an economic gain associated in the form of a dividend with raising the tax, I think that's a politically saleable thing that the left can advance. Uh, so anyway, last, uh, last slide. Um, Backwards and forwards. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Start with the carbon tax and dividend. Um, that's not enough, I think, is my top to make clear. But then all along the way, educate about the need to do more, including a basic income as part of the solution to prosperity without growth. And that's all I have to say for today. <laughs> I guess I'm just wondering, has there been much research on how imp implementing a basic income would affect growth? Because I could imagine something like if you're doing a really redistributive policy, all of a sudden you're taking money from people who maybe have much higher propensity to save money, giving to people who have much higher propensity to spend money, and maybe you actually get increased yeah. consumption and growth. Yeah, I think that, that question has been raised, and I don't have a good answer to that. I think that that's probably an implication of redistribution, is it's going to have uh, an impetus toward growth. Now, if you just look at the carbon dividend piece of that, uh, I think the net effect is beneficial. There may be uh, some growth in spending overall, but people will be spending less on carbon fuel because the prices are going up, and they'll be spending more on renewable. They'll be, they'll be spending money on you know, insulating their houses, buying electric cars rather than gas guzzlers. So I think the net effect on environment would be beneficial. And in fact, if if there's some small window of green growth possible, then you might welcome that. But uh, if you're giving people, people basic income, but you're reducing uh, the size of the economy in other ways, then that's going to be counteracted by other other policies. So, yeah. But I, I, you're right on the target. I think. Yeah, yeah, I see that, that. That, that's a basic income. People who are not particularly keyed into the 
climate dimension of this, often argue for basic income as a way to get out of Piketty's problem yeah. of, of uh, you know, stagnant growth. Take the money from people who only save it, give it to poor people, and they'll spend it. And then the economy will be booming. But there's an ecological downside to that. Yeah. Omar? Yeah. Um, you, you may be aware of this uh, quotation, but Dale, Dale Jameson wrote a couple of years ago that um, all efforts of mitigation climate change so far have failed. The one exception being one you mentioned, which is an economic depression, which lowers productivity. So the game in the 21st century is all going to be about adaptation. That was his conclusion. Now, I don't expect you to agree with the state so generally, but I wonder if it's possible for you to conceive of separating the carbon tax side of your argument from the reduction of growth side. Maybe the reduction of growth side is actually a kind of adaptation that can achieve some mitigation in the end, whether or not we have a carbon tax. So I wonder if you could comment on that. Uh, I really hadn't thought about that. I, I, my way into that was saying if you raise the carbon tax high enough, it will induce uh, recession if you don't do anything else. Uh, but yeah, to keep tar carbon tax out of this uh, picture, how would you imagine reducing growth by other means? Well, you referred to Piketty saying that global growth rates are declining yeah. in his view anyway. Yeah. There's a lot of evidence for that. Yeah. We're never going to hit economic growth rates that you see in the 20th century again. Right. So, and for a variety of reasons, climate change being one of them, one major one, you could easily see economies hitting recession. I mean, they're, you know, just from the hurricanes that have been occurring, they're, you know, economists are already talking about the you know, recessionary possible yeah. recessionary consequences. It, it could so, be that the, the the climate change will come much more rapidly right. and itself um, cause such damage to economies that they will shrink. That's my suggestion. So, yeah. so that's why it seems to be Jameson's point is all the interesting battles are about how do we adapt. And if we adapt in certain ways, some of the suggestions you made, whether or not a carbon tax ever happens or not, I personally don't see it ever happening. But whether or not that happens, we adapt in certain ways, something about you know, the second half of your talk, um, then we can achieve some, some, you know, some mitigation as well. But in any case, we're going to have to adapt one way or another. Yeah. Yeah, it's just that if, if we adapt as the crises are forced on us by nature, it will be too late and Sorry. with tremendous, uh, you know, the people who will suffer most will be the people who can least uh, face those disasters. So this is well, that, that's about the politics yeah. of adaptation, yeah. whether they can head off those you know, kind of ways. Yeah, yeah. I guess I'm, I'm still wanting to push for mitigation yeah. while there's a little window of that, okay. and at a certain point it will be moved. Uh, there's what I hope and what I predict. What I predict is more like what you're talking about, but what I hope is still it's what I'm talking about here. Aaron. Yeah. Um, so. Uh, uh, thank you. Um, you mentioned a guaranteed green jobs program towards the beginning, and, and I've heard in, in arguments over UBI generally, and, and um, I say this, you know, they weren't really considering the growth trap in relation to, you know, the ecological factors, but a federal uh, jobs guarantee, I've often heard that kind of offered as a counter proposal to UBI, um, and I'm wondering you know, because you mentioned towards the beginning, but I, I didn't really see it in the end. Yeah. And I'm wondering what your thoughts are, and, and if, you know, is there, because it seems to be, at least in the, you know, debates around it, a kind of tension between, you know, which vision we want, which kind of, like, realistic utopia we want to work with. And I'm wondering if you see them as opposed, or if maybe the dynamic changes in the context of the, the growth yeah, trend. I've, I've been involved in some debates about that, and, Kind of in the middle ground between those two camps. It's it's certainly possible to have a basic income and a government-funded jobs program. Government is employer last resort. There are some budget constraints at some point. I'm trying to do both, but uh, my own position on it is: if there are good public goods reasons for funding uh, employment in areas where the market isn't providing it, like uh, universal daycare, for example, then 
that's a good thing to do. Uh, I'm, I'm generally skeptical of creating jobs just so that you can ensure that people have income and you force them into employment as a condition for getting it. I think we need to get beyond that way of thinking. Um, so the you know, burden proof is on the people proposing the jobs that they be genuine things that are not, we need that are not now being provided. Um, so uh, I don't know if that's... No, that's Hi. Uh, I work with a company that does international infrastructure development, and I recently met with the energy minister of Nigeria. Now, they have 170 million people, and he was telling me that they produce, as a country, 11,000 megawatts of electricity in total. That happens to be what Manhattan uses every day. They are gangbusters. They've got the third largest deposited by two of coal in the world, and all they need is energy. That's all they care about, because their economy is going to never get there. It will remain a rural place, and they don't want to. How can we apply any of these lessons to African, South American countries that are ex ready to explode with growth using any energy they can get? That's where, because everybody's affected by global warming and climate change, everybody should be trying to do something about it. So that uh, when I was talking about the United States reducing its consumption by its emissions by 46% and then uh, making sure that they're reduced elsewhere by another 44%, it's places like Nigeria where we have to, in effect, say, uh, if you'll leave that coal in the ground, uh, we'll give you the money put up solar panels and steel, whatever the feasible technology is. Uh, because otherwise, they're going to burn the coal, and then the, you know, our east coast is going to go into water. Yeah. So it's, it's, not just it's not charity. It's, it's a collective it's solution. Yeah, exactly. Um, uh, I have a question. Um, thanks for your presentation. Uh, I'm wondering um, if there's, if you've uh, identified any connection to um, different ways of conceptualizing growth. Uh, because of course, the you know, GDP growing, that's just a proxy for, uh, GDP growth is just a proxy for increase in standard of living. And we know, of course, it doesn't capture all important um, developments. And so when you think about what a basic income might do, the kind of economy that it might create, might create an economy where people, um, as you said, are not chasing after positional goods for one thing and causing a lot of stuff that we don't need to be manufactured and the associated um, carbon emission um, as a result of that, but also maybe doing um, you know, more things for themselves or living more, uh, you know, engaging more creative activity that's harder to, or more um, caring, affiliative activity it's harder to capture in growth makers. So have you um, identified any, I'm just curious. I haven't actually written on that, but that's where I think I need to go next, because. Um, to suggest that we might bring the GDP figures down, but actually increase our standard of living. You know, I, I, I don't like the word degrowth. Yeah, because it, does. The, I mean, the people who introduce it say they want to use that term because it signals a break from a dominant paradigm. And we have to smash that paradigm and move on to something else. But, I think we need to get the positive paradigm that we're replacing, and it has to be, well, Tim Jackson has this phrase, prosperity without growth. What is it to prosper, to do well, to live well? Uh, and we have historical examples of this. Go back to Aristotle. Uh, he proposes in the politics a natural limit to wealth. And if you own more than that, you must be neurotic. You're worried about you know, dying, and you're not focused on living well. And living well means with a, a, a fixed amount, you can live an active life where you participate in the political affairs of your community, where you have time to reflect and theorize and do science and art, and caring. Um, we need to focus on those things so that what we're really doing is we're getting ourselves out of what is already for a couple of hundred years been a deranged, manic economy in the first place. And so I think this ultimately becomes a kind of eco-socialism where you talk about 
better way of life that will also dovetail with solving the climate problem. Former student has a question. Yes. Um, so thank you for the talk. And my question is that the most of the literature I've read about UBIs just that they um, basically be flat. Like uh, people get the same amount of money from universal basic income regardless of their um, regardless of like their income levels or the wealth where they fall in the economic spectrum. Um, but my question is, do you think that maybe we need to make the dividend progressive um, for lower income households, or even if we were to think on a more global scale, like lower income nations? Hmm. Yeah, but I didn't uh, limit some time. I didn't try to get into global responsibilities versus national ones. Uh, but I think there are different ways of designing a carbon tax in the context of an international agreement where part of the tax uh, funds a, a national basic income, and part of it goes into an international fund that augments the basic incomes that could be generated by carbon taxes in other countries. So that's something like that is I think, what I'm pushed for. And as far as making the dividend progressive, so I think you, you give more of it to low-income households and less of it to upper income. The only difficulty there is uh, the, there's a kind of welfare paradox that's been written about that if you design policies that are targeted, they promise to give more to the people who need it most, but they end up giving less because in being targeted, the group becomes stigmatized. Everybody else feels like we're paying for it and they're taking it, and, and then it becomes uh, fixed in time. It doesn't rise with inflation. And people end up worse and worse off. So that universal benefits, although they're spread more thinly, uh, tend to be more generous. Look at Social Security. Rich people get it, poor people get it. But it's a, a, one of the more stable uh, forms of income, uh, you know, state distributed income that we have. Compare that with Canada food stamps and you can see the difference. So I kind of shy away from making this a program that's to benefit poor people and rather frame it as everybody gets their per capita share of it, which will in fact have a progressive effect counteracting the regressivity of the tax. Back here first. <clears throat> Thanks for the talk. Um, fascinating. Carbon tax is uh, inherently highly progressive because of differing uh, consumption patterns. The, the higher up you go in the income and capital um, ladder. And um, hence, the enemy of a progressive t tax are waiting up there. So that the, the people at the top are obviously the ones with most resistance. Now, in the case of carbon, uh, some, some evidence now suggests that carbon is actually a multi uh, CO2 emissions are, is actually a multiplier of inequality. And if you compare, uh, say, a top decile and, and bottom decile in terms of income, and the ratio is, say, 1 to 6, then the ratio in CO2 emission could be up to 25. Now, this is comparing deciles. If you compare the top percent percentile, then you can get into extraordinary disparities and extraordinary uh, resistance to go with it. So is, is your understanding of the chances of ever getting um, carbon tax, does that, do you take into account also the kind of resistance that you would be getting from households and individuals who may be emitting thousand and, and 10,000 10, times more than the average person. Yeah, they, they always, they'll resist any kind of tax. And so I think we just have to face this as a, a kind of a class struggle. I agree. To, to have the kind of uh, uh, effective environmental policy, you're really going to have to take on the power of the fossil fuel companies and wealthy households people whose whole mode of uh, income generation is premised on growth. I think there are lots of occupations that are just a matter of 
putting money down and then getting money back only because there's been some expansion. And if you're moving toward some more steady state, there won't even be a place for such occupations. So, um, uh, the question I don't have an answer to is the politics of this. What kind of coalition can we build to effectively uh, push for policies that are uh, uh, ecologically sound, that really rise to this challenge, that do it with attention to fairness, uh, to take account the, the kind of interests that are going to be at odds with this. Uh, that's, well, I don't know if that's for any one theorist to do, but we need to put our heads together, and we also just need to get people together. Um, let me start out by saying I'm with Woody Allen. I think we're screwed. I'm, I'm quite obsessive about the need for degrowth. Without it, you know, we're heading down a path of self-destruction. And I don't think it's going to happen. I don't think we're going to find the path that will prevent that. Um, <clears throat> but I want to raise a, an issue which really follows up on what you just said, uh, that makes it even worse, make, makes things look even worse, which is that uh, even if there were some political possibility of, of degrowth, um, you really have to cut off from the top. You know, you have to push everybody, you have to push those on the top down because they contribute so much more to um, the pollution problem than do poor people. And you have to make, you, you can't do it, I mean, if fairness is defined by everybody paying a proportionate share, which one, was one of your earlier statements, you know, you're going to be taking away from the poorest people, putting them below the level of survival. So you really have to think in terms of cutting people off at the top and allowing those at the bottom to have more within a context that nevertheless somehow reduces the toll on the environment. I just wonder if that's been worked into any of the, of the models. Uh. Not any of the models of carbon tax and dividend I've seen. Mm -hmm. They tend to treat that as a kind of a standalone policy. But mm -hmm. like I said, this the one modeling I did of that thirty-five percent per year, thirty-five dollars per year tax. Mm -hmm. Nobody's proposed anything that yeah. ambitious, and I think it's more of a thought experiment than a real proposal because it entails you have to do a lot more than just that that policy if you're going to actually see it through to reality. And it, there's another massive change that's about to kind of swoop over us, and that's demographic. Uh, the the uh, arrival of people in this country, baby boomers, to so, uh, 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 you know, again changing the constellation, you know, reorganization of, a, of the workforce, uh, of the population. So many more people, uh, many more people being older, living longer, and, uh, and, and, and all kinds of social consequences of that. And that's something that's going to happen in the, in the industrialized world, too. How does all that, how, how, you know, that's a lot of different stuff, but how does that play into any of this? Because it's, you know, they're, they're running on parallel tracks, but yeah. I'm wondering. Yeah. Well, if you're talking just about a higher proportion of people in the category of retired people, yeah. that piece, I think it creates additional problems. A lot of old, old people for degrowth because the, the way that the, the program is currently being structured, it's premised on growing the economy in order to be able to accommodate more numbers. Uh, and even then, people say that you know, there's problems with whether this is going to work out, you know, change changes, changes in the way it's funded. So I think if you degrowth only makes that problem worse. And what about the composition of the labor force, caring for, you know, um, social needs and so forth, maybe uh, lesser skilled work, but nevertheless, you know, what happens to the labor force that takes care of all these people, of us? Well, the caring piece of it is something that basic income advocates often stress. I think it's one of the, in fact, it, uh, when people have done opinion surveys, mm -hmm. it's the thing that people find most appealing about the idea of basic income is that it, it recognizes and compensates people doing care work uh, without 
without turning it into wage and labor. Um, and so it will enable people to do more of this care work. Uh, and it will enable people to do it, do part-time paid care work and also have another source of income to make that part-time work viable. So the basic income piece of that I think is quite relevant to the consumer raising and can make sorting through those difficult problems a little easier. I thought you were going to say something about the, the growth of world population, okay. and, and maybe that's partly what you that's were slowing down. I, I think, I mean, populations tend to stick, to level off when you reach a certain level of affluence and when women are educated. So, um, if we have policies and, and climate change could be a piece of this, if we take into account seriously these global responsibilities, uh, if we're enabling people to develop out of poverty without reliance on fossil fuels, we'll also be taking them out of the conditions where they feel the necessity to reproduce at the levels that they do. So if we're worried about population as a key piece of what's driving climate change, well, there's, I think, some pointers toward the answers. We need to reduce inequality globally. Uh, and we need to educate women about their reproductive rights. And that, I think, will be, uh, maybe have a chance of keeping the population somewhat lower than it's projected to, to be. Alex? So um, you, you mentioned a little bit about this um, as sort of the, uh, the gun will be to our head, so to speak, when it comes to making international transfers of technology of ability to create green jobs in developing countries because otherwise they're going to go after the resources well those that have the resources to, to point at our head of course but I was wondering since enlightened self, enlightened long-term self-interest doesn't seem to be in like long supply I was wondering if you can say more about the possibility of international institutions or agreements or what might help this process for coordination, enforcement, and, uh, and also for maybe a degree of fairness even for those countries that do need to continue growing but also don't have those resources to uh, hold the developed world hostage with and say we'll burn this coal uh, if you don't give us stuff. I'm not sure if this will and anything to what I've already said, but um, you know, the, uh, the only countries that um, criticized the Paris Accords, I think, were the United States, Syria, and Nicaragua. And my understanding is Nicaragua objected because they thought it didn't go far enough. So the United States is, is kind of an outlier, and although it's one of the two largest polluters, um, the other countries that are on board that we need to do something could just be uh, put more pressure on the United States. Maybe that's what needs to happen. It's, I'm not sure what we can do here other than to welcome that kind of pressure and uh, uh, try to stop the reactionary forces against it. Uh, I don't know. That's not, maybe not the best answer you were looking for, but um, it's not no answer. It just maybe more than I think might be really in the world. So. Yeah. If, if we're thinking of the political solution, then part of the question is who stands as the resistance to this solution. So carbon tax, fossil fuel companies will be the main resistors. Uh, basic income, well, it depends how you take basic income. If you take it as a potential growth, then actually certain parts of the capitalist establishment might accept it. They do. But if the move is degrowth, even if it's phrased prosperity outgrowth, it's the capitalist class as a whole, the global capitalist class, which means if the education isn't an education to undermine the whole global capitalist system, then they're going to win. Because you think they can't be defeated? No, not because they can't be defeated, but if, you, if the elephant in the room isn't mentioned, ah. they know what they're doing. They understand that a degrowth economy is not to their interest because 
the whole imperative is to accumulate. Mm -hmm. So they understand that that is their annihilation. Mm -hmm. They're going to fight it every tooth and nail. If we don't name it, then we lose. That's part of the education process that we have to carry on. Right? But in that education process, if we don't name the main problem, mm -hmm. um, we have a problem. Yeah. yeah. I think you're right. I mean, we have to put capitalism on the table and talk about it. Yeah. And that doesn't. I guess you're right. Yeah, you didn't expect such a friendly one. <laughs> <laughs> and we've had this conversation yeah. before. Yeah, this is where, you know, I mean, I've, uh, my roots are in Marxism, and, but I'm not an economist. And I've encountered economists, and John Stuart Mill, I think, is the earliest to say this, but they're contemporary people who do an equilibrium models who say, you can have a capitalist economy that's a steady state. Uh, and we talked about this last mm -hmm. night. Yeah. So I don't want to rule that out as a theoretical possibility. Uh, that you could still have private ownership, people who get income from property, people who sell their labor and income from wages, and the return on the property is a fixed sum annually. It doesn't grow. Property owners are still getting their fixed amount of uh, return on their investment. Uh, they're just not growing. They're not getting richer. They're just at a certain level. Uh, I can imagine a class of people who might be content with that. I mean, rich people, at a certain point, they don't need more money. They just, it's just what they do is to make more. But they don't need any more. They don't know what to do with it. In fact, part of the problem from Piketty's point of view is that they're not spending it, right? So, uh, so it's a matter of uh, rethinking what a more egalitarian kind of capitalism could be. I, I mean, I'm partial to socialism here, but I don't want to rule out what might be a theoretical possibility that you could have some kind of egalitarian capitalism, what Rawls calls a property-owning democracy where you spread the wealth very widely through citizen shares and mutual funds and that type of thing. That could be a steady state. Tell me why that's impossible. Next time. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, if just going on from that, it seems unlikely that a steady state could ever be possible to me, at least because you'd have to assume that technology would never improve, that people would never have better ideas of how to do anything. I mean, uh, that just seems, that's not going to happen unless there's really some global catastrophe and people's standard of living is so low that it couldn't possibly get better. I mean, uh, but, yeah, you can... I mean, you can have... You can have improvements and change, but you don't have to have a steadily rising throughput of materials and energy. Well, one's ability to control energy surely could improve. Uh, one of the, the things that's been going through my head while listening to this is, I don't. I think that there should be a, a distinction made between money, when talking about growth, and technology talking about growth, that is, our ability to improve standard of living, to, to control our environment. Um, so when people talk about degrowth, uh, they seem to usually be talking about eliminating consumption of things that aren't important, but we still need things that are important, and we need, we need, we need them in greater quantities. We're going to need more food, we're going to need more, more housing. Ideally, we would also need more energy, but just produced in a, a way that doesn't involve carbon. So it seems like this is a technological problem, and it requires a technological solution, at least to me. We, we need to stop. We need energy, but we just need to not make it in the way that we have currently been doing it for the last 150 years. Yeah, I mean, I've em emphasized carbon pollution here, but there's also uh, other resources, land. Sure. Uh, minerals. The Earth has a finite amount of these, so uh, even without the global warming crisis, there's a, there are environmental limits to growth. Maybe we maybe we go another century or so before we start uh, exceeding those to the point where we're facing the kind of problem we're now facing with 
environmental pollution, but That's a lot true. of those problems are already quite serious. So. That's true, but the solar system is very big. If we become a space space, uh, if, we, if we have technology to go and mine asteroids, as, as private companies are already starting to, like these people li literally raising money, Luxembourg just uh, had this initiative for space mining, so uh, or to, to fund space mining ventures in California. I mean, these things could happen. Obviously, this is pretty far out, but yeah. um, I just I, when I hear degrowth, it just it it doesn't seem compatible with human life and human flourishing um, to me personally, and I think possibly to many others as well. I guess I'd go back for an example where it doesn't mean stagnation is, uh, and maybe you could undermine it by pointing out that exactly what you're talking about was going on at the same time, but if you go back to ancient Greece, um, they were developing mathematics, they, were cre they created theater, philosophy, but they didn't have, they weren't on the kind of material consumption growth trajectory mm -hmm. that we've seen in the last couple of centuries. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what, and I, I read recently a book called Fossil Capital, and it's about the, the origin of the carbon-based capitalist economy, which is only, um, you know, less than a couple hundred years old. Uh, and there was a choice at a certain point whether you would continue with the flow, which is wind and water, or you go with stock, which is coal and oil. And interestingly, it was much cheaper to use the flow. So there was a kind of puzzle. Why did capitalists shift from flow to stock? And it had more to do with the social relations production. It was easier to assemble the workers in one place and control them if you were using steam engines than if you had to attract them to river banks out in the country, scattered all over the place. Um, so the question is, could we go back to the flow and get off the stock and have something more like the steady state flow of energy? It wouldn't mean that there's no progress, but it would progress in other things besides consumption of more and more material and energy. You find the level of energy you need to do other kinds of things, like caring, like writing poetry, like putting on plays, like, you know, uh, and, you know, and, and improvements in medical, <laughs> and doing political philosophy. Well, I guess on that note, let me, uh, let's all thank uh,